may be seated. We want to remind everyone that next week we'll enjoy a fellowship meal together following the service. Each family is asked to bring a salad and dessert to share. The main part of the meal will be provided by our amazing kitchen crew. And now Melissa has an announcement for us. Thank you. Uh, on the back table, you will see friendship directories. This is how we stay connected with each other outside of church. If you are fairly new to Linden Bible Church, your information is probably not in here. You will find directory forms also on the back table. Please fill one out and drop it in the offering box on your way out. Uh, <clears throat> Holly, come on up, and uh, Tim, uh, I don't see the others. Sam. Okay, and uh, Daryl. <clears throat> oh, yeah, Sam, okay. <clears throat> uh, these folks are going to be uh, heading to Guatemala next Saturday, and uh, they're serving on a on, on a team that's uh, from the Methodist Church, uh, and they've joined them for this trip. So, um, <clears throat> as become our joy and our, our privilege, we want to pray over them uh, as uh, they prepare and as uh, they go on this trip. Of course, the prayers will continue for them. So, um, since my voice is a little bit questionable this morning, Daryl is going to pray. So it's not that he can get closer to God right now, but <laughs> so, but we want to pray over you and, and honor you as, uh, you know, we're blessed. I mean, do you want to tell people what you're going to do before we pray? You want to do it, Holly? Okay. 
Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, the trip to Guatemala, it's a mission to a children's home. Children that have been taken out of their homes because of really bad circumstances. And um, they are put by the government into this, this uh, home that is a Christian home. And it has a huge um, uh, positive reputation with the government. So that's kind of cool. But what we get to do is we get to go, we meet them, we play with the children, we, we meet the workers, we get to give the workers a night off, and, and we get to take care of the kids and play and do games and, and do some organizing uh, of, of sharing the gospel like a, like a one-day VBS type thing. And we get to go to the community and do another VBS for a local church. And, um, and then uh, another sweet thing is that we get to go into the market, buy things, fill up a huge uh, tub, like a wash tub, uh, with, with, with uh, um, staples and sub, uh, things that, that we can, um, basic things for uh, the widows that the, the, the home has been taken care of and being in touch with and making sure that they, they can, can uh, grow in their walk with Christ, with Christ too. Let's pray. Lord, I lift up Holly and Laurel and Tim and Sam uh, to you today as they, next week, they begin their journey to Guatemala, stepping out in faith. And Lord, I, I pray that even though it's familiar to some of them, this location and the people, that they trust and lean on you because each year is different. And Lord, I just um, ask for the opportunity for their living testimony to be seen there. Keep them safe, keep them in your presence, um, and may their joy be seen on their faces as they share your love for everyone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing, start our, our um, set off with Blessed Be Your Name, and one uh, phrase in that that we sing that really sticks out to me is you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord blessed be your name Blessed be your name, 
Blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his host. Praise him sun, moon, and stars. Praise him heavens of heaven and waters that are above the earth. Praise the Lord. Glory. 
morning. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made. Help us to be glad and rejoice in it. Father, your mercies are new to us each and every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father, we praise you for your wonders of creation and mighty deeds of redemption. Thank you for redeeming us as a people for your own possession through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, our guarantee of that future glory which you have prepared for us. Father, thank you for the great privilege of worship this morning. Please aid us by your Spirit to offer to you acceptable worship through Jesus Christ. And may you be pleased through our worship to greater conform us into the image of your Son. May we conform our wills to your will. May our desires be your desires. May we love what you love and hate what you hate. Help us to love righteousness and to abhor sin, especially the sin in our own hearts. We confess our sins, Father, and we ask that you would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, help us not to sin, but to always remember that if we do, we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ the righteous, our propitiation and our mediator. Father, we ask that you would be pleased to help those among us who are struggling with temptation, strengthen and encourage them through your worship today and from the singing of our songs to the preaching of your word. Father, thank you for your gracious provision to each of us throughout this past week and providing everything we need for life. 
We ask that you'd be pleased to do the same again this week and help us to seek first your kingdom and righteousness, trusting you for the provision of these other things. Father, we especially pray for those struggling with illness today or those recovering from surgeries. Please be with them and be to them the great comforter and great physician. Lord, we are not ashamed to ask for miraculous healings, for we know with you all things are possible. And so we pray this especially for Jesse Nelson. Thank you for his recent profession of faith. And we ask that you be pleased to bring comfort and peace to him, his wife Kirsten, and their son Logan. And Father, we, ple- we ask that you would also be pleased to be with uh, Chad this morning, as well as his wife Olivia and their kids, uh, as he continues to recover from uh, the surgery, Father. And Father, please be with Pastor Joel as he preaches your word. May you give him the words to say. And may all of us have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts made ready to receive instruction from your word. Sanctify us in truth this morning. Your word is truth. We pray all of this to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Kyle. Um, uh, the family he mentioned is a family I, I visited uh, last night, and um, uh, uh, Jesse is um, uh, had has had a long battle with cancer, and um, appears to be soon to go home. And so we want to keep them in prayer. Um, He's 43 years old, and his uh, son is 16, so, um, but we'll allow all those involved in Children's Church the opportunity to be dismissed uh, this morning. (laughs) Are you... uh, comfortable this morning? Are you warm here this morning? (laughs) If you are, we can say thanks to Tim here. Uh, He uh, replaced our main circulating pump in our heating system this week, and uh, which seems to be on its last legs. So uh, we're thankful for Tim and uh, keeping us warm this morning. (laughs) So uh, Well, let me just uh, ask the Lord to uh, bless us as we listen to his word this morning. Father, I just uh, amen the prayers of Kyle and just ask that you would uh, allow me to speak uh, clearly uh, your word this morning. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our study in 1 Peter, uh, starting in chapter 3 this morning. Um, The theme, as you remember, is persevering with joy in the midst of persecution and suffering. And uh, Peter has been reminding us in this book as chosen sojourners uh, of our glorious salvation and that that glorious salvation should lead to God-honoring lives. And part of that God-honoring lifestyle is one of submission to authority, and that's been um, kind of his focus in chapter 2, just reminding us that um, the foundational issue of, of authority that we're called to submit to all God-ordained authority as part of our obedience to Christ, and that there's also a freedom within that authority, not a freedom to sin, but a freedom to love and serve God and others. Um, And uh, he's been giving some examples of that, uh, our submission to governmental authority, and then our submission in what we would call the workplace, servants uh, and masters uh, who are suffering. and reminded us of the example and also the substitutionary uh, atonement of Christ, who's the ultimate um, suffering servant. In chapter 3, he's going to address another issue in regard to authority, and that's authority in the marriage relationship. Um, So I've entitled today, Submission and Leadership in Marriage. Um, You know, as a pastor, when you come to these passages and you're going to talk about the S word, um, not sex, but submission, uh, (laughs) you sometimes wish that your associate pastor was taking this passage. (laughs) He was smiling this week, (laughs) I think, uh, glad for me to handle this one. (laughs) So we're going to trust the Lord, and, and, uh, you know, part of it is... um, you know, Peter's addressing a culture in, in first century Rome 
where this uh, principle was uh, not, all, you know, it was probably a part of the societal principle much more so than today, but there were also some real issues with it. Um, and there are certainly issues with the whole idea and understanding of submission in our culture today. Um, so we'll, we'll try and disabuse ourselves of some of the cultural understanding of that and, uh, and put our, our feet fa firmly planted on uh, God, what God's word has to say. So Peter begins with what I call the general principle of submission for wives. He says, likewise, wives, be subject or be submitted to your own husbands, so that if, even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So Peter begins this passage with the word likewise, so it means in a similar way, uh, in a similar way that we are called to be under authority to government and particularly um, the previous um, passage about uh, masters and, and servants or we would say employers and employees, um, that, that there's a principle of authority in the marriage relationship or in the home as well. And it's similar in the sense uh, that it's similar in motive, that we're to honor God by serving others. Um, you know, that's part of his principle here, that as believers who were often misunderstood in their culture of, uh, in that day, much as we are today sometimes, um, the, the way to, the way to um, kind of fight against that was to, to live God-honoring lives that others around them could see, uh, lives that were different. Um, and so he's, he's addressing, you know, various uh, people along the way. But, um, you know, part of that is that we honor God by loving and serving others. Um, and not just, uh, it's, it's also similar in, in application. He's going to make the application for wives uh, like he did with masters and servants, that it's not just to those who treat us well. It's even to those who don't treat us well and that that becomes a testimony in itself. So um, Peter addresses this to wives, um, and the command is to be subject or be submitted. You know, we need to, to start with what is submission. Uh, submission is to voluntarily place oneself under the authority of another. It was used often as a military term in, in uh, Peter's day, it is a subordination of role or function. And that's going to be very important because we're going to try and talk about um, what submission is and some of the misunderstandings uh, of submission as well. But the command to these wives is to be submitted or to be subject. And to whom? To your own husbands. That's important too. It's not be submitted to men in general. <laughs> it's not to be submitted to somebody else's husband, but to be submitted to particularly your own marriage partner. She is to submit to her husband's leadership in the home. And that also means, um, and, and Paul brings this out in his passage in, in Ephesians 5 on, on submission and marriage, that he is to lead in the home rather than being passive. And I would say that one of the biggest problems that I see in Christian marriages is husbands who are passive and not leading, particularly leading spiritually. And it's very difficult. It puts a wife in a difficult position uh, to submit to her husband, to follow her husband when he's not leading. Um, and so a lot of the trouble, um, guys, starts with us. <laughs> it... Um, since the whole context here is to your own husbands or to the marriage context, I want to just, I know um, last year we, we talked about um, uh, God's beautiful design of marriage, but I'm going to go back and kind of give us a little review course in that, um, you know, because I think we have to understand God's blueprint for marriage, God's design for marriage, and I think it's a beautiful design uh, if we're going to understand uh, submission and, and love in marriage. The, according to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, um, God outlines the partners in marriage, uh, and that is to bring a man and a woman, both created in God's image, into a blessed relationship co called marriage for the purpose of carrying out his mandate on earth. 
And uh, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And man here is in the generic sense of mankind or humankind. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's the mandate. So God created man or humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created uh, them. Male and female, he created them. So God, um, in the creation of marriage, created two distinct genders um, that were different from each other but complementary to each other. Um, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So he gave them a mandate to be stewards of the earth that he created. Um, And it's very important we start there because this verse makes very clear that there are two genders um, that God created. There are two God-ordained genders and only two. And that both of those genders, male and female, are made in the image and the likeness of God. And that means that we have equal inherent value and worth as both men and women. Um, And that becomes important when we get to the marriage relationship. The purpose of marriage, um, uh, God is going to go outline in chapter 2 when he talks about the creation of Eve, and particularly Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Um, God designed a husband and wife to be complementary companions on the basis of a committed love relationship that would lead to complete oneness. Um, So, you know, God saw in his creation that he had created Adam and that it wasn't good. Um, And why wasn't it good? It wasn't good for him to be alone. So God determined that he would solve that problem by creating uh, what he says is a helper or a companion. Sometimes I think that word helper has a negative context uh, in our, or an inferiority context in, in our Uh, English language, but that word is used of God himself. Um, So he he created a partner or a companion for this man who was fit or literally who was suited for him. Literally, it means corresponding to him. So God created these these two people for marriage, a a man and a woman, to complete each other. Um, Neither of them had all that God intended for this relationship and so he, he created a woman who was corresponding or suitable or an exact fit for her husband. Um, I think of it as two puzzle pieces. Um, you know, God didn't create two of these or two of these. He created one of each of these that were designed to perfectly complement each other, to complete each other. And so one of the things it teaches us about marriage is that we're incomplete without our marriage partner. Um, and then, you know, God brings uh, this, um, he, he determines to bring Adam to, I mean, Eve to Adam, um, sends him on a trip to the zoo, and he sees that none of those zoo animals are going to uh, solve his loneliness. And so God creates Eve to be this complementary companion to him. And the first exclamation in all of Scripture is in Genesis 2.23, when after he's put to sleep and, and God takes from, you know, the chunk out of his side, his rib, uh, and makes a woman of her uh, out of uh, that, he says, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. Woman means out of man. So Adam sees Eve, uh, And he immediately exclaims, she's the one. She's the perfect fit for me. She is designed to complete me. And this is an exclamation of joy in scripture. Um, And out of that, God designed marriage in Genesis 2, 24 and 25. uh, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave or cling to or be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So marriage involves a leaving of previous, you know, mom and dad and previous relationships, uh, a cleaving, a clinging to or a joining in a covenant of love. 
uh, and then a becoming of one flesh, uh, you know, physical intimacy as well as an intimacy of heart and mind, and in that order, leave, cleave, and become one. So we need to understand submission in the context of what biblical marriage is, first of all, that God designed these two partners in marriage to complete each other. Um, and I, I want to say a few things about what biblical submission in marriage is and is not, and we'll start with the is not. <laughs> submission is not inferiority or inequality of value or worth. Genesis 1:26 through 28 establishes that. This, by the way, I think is the lie of feminism, which says roles equal value. Uh, roles determine value. If I accept a lesser role or, or a submitted role, then I'm less value than my marriage partner. God's word never says that. God's word never says roles determine value. Um, value, our value as human beings is always of equal value and worth before God. Um, uh, and, um, you know, a number of passages, Peter's going to bring this out in verse 7 when he talks to husbands. Um, Galatians 3.28 reminds us that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's not that in this life God, um, you know, obliterates role, those, those roles, but it's a reminder that spiritually we are of equal value, seen just the same in value and worth to God. Um, so submission is not inferiority or inequality of value or worth. Uh, we're created equally in God's image and we're equal heirs of Christ spiritually. Um, but God does give us different roles, both in the church and the home. And, um, and God calls us to those roles as part of his good design for marriage. Um, so uh, submission is not inferiority, but submission is also not demeaning. Um, you know, the, the ultimate example of submission is Jesus Christ himself. Um, Christ submitted to the Father, and he gives infinite value to the grace of submission by his own example. Uh, submission is not disrespect or demeaning. Uh, we are all called to submit to, su to some authority. And 1 Corinthians 11.3 remi um, reminds us, ooh, I wrote down the wrong verse there. Do we have that one? Yeah. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And look at this, the head of Christ is God. Um, Jesus Christ submitted to the Father. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 tells us e even in eternity, Paul's talking about, you know, the resurrection and the completion of all things here on earth. And it says, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be suggested to him, that's the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. There is a, a sub, submission of function within even the Trinity. Um, and so Christ, uh, you know, beautifully demonstrates this uh, in, in many passages. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9 is another one. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, uh, the self-humbling of Christ that, you know, though he was equal with God, that, that he came down and became one of us and became a servant among us and even died for us. And therefore God has highly exalted him. And given him the name which is above every name, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ's submission didn't in any way um, demean his value or worth uh, with the Father. And so submission, we learn from Christ himself, is not meant to be demeaning. Submission is also not um, suppression or abuse. Peter is going to speak about this. Um, and 1 John 4, 18 reminds us there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has been perfected in love. Um, in Colossians 3, 19, it says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So all the way through Scripture, we're reminded that... Um, Suppression or any kind of abuse is not true submission, uh, and it's not true leadership either. 
And so I would say that creating a climate of fear or stifling our spouse, uh, who is meant to complete us, is contrary to God's command to be a servant leader and to love our wife, which Ephesians chapter 5 uh, lays out very clearly for us as husbands. We're called to be servant leaders. And our primary command in marriage is what? To love our wives. Um, and with a self-sacrificing love of Christ. So submission out of fear is not true submission. And part of a healthy marriage involves discussing issues, seeking counsel and the advice of our wife, allowing her to use her complementary gifts to benefit our marriage and our home. Um, that's wisdom. Now let me say a couple of things about what submission is. Submission is, as I said earlier, subordination of function or roles. Wives are called to accept a role uh, that allows her husband to be the leader or the head of their relationship and home. And true headship means that a husband has the final authority and bears the ultimate responsibility for the decisions and the direction of the family in submission to Christ. And so he, too, is called to submit, but his submission is to Christ. Um, and so, we, you know, we can't say this enough. Submission is about roles. It's about our functional roles. Um, secondly, submission is obedience. Uh, it's often, um, often those words are used interchangeably. Um, First Peter right here, 3, 6, reminds us of that. Submission to authority and obedience to authority are one and the same, and they're often used interchangeably. Partial submission or obedience is not submission. Uh, you know, I'll submit to him when I agree with him. I used to have a dog like that. You know, she'd get loose, and, and she'd hide behind this little tiny tree in our yard, and I'd call her, and she'd, she'd be hiding behind this little tiny tree saying, I... I, I could read dog language. She, she, she'd be saying, you can't see me. I'm not coming. She would only come when she agreed that it was time to come. <laughs> That's not submission. Uh, submission, in fact, in Ephesians 5.24, it says, in everything. Um, even when agreement has not been reached, a wife must trust God to be sovereign over her husband and his decisions. And her submission is ultimately to Christ. I always tell people you need to be able to see beyond your husband to Christ who stands before him. And he, he's perfect. You can submit to him even if this guy isn't quite perfect yet and, and won't be. A wise servant leader as a husband seeks to come to agreement before making important decisions. Uh, I also want to say that submission to grossly unbiblical or immoral behavior must also be refused in obedience to Christ and their marriage vows. When a husband asks his wife to do or uh, something that's in clear contradiction to Scripture uh, and, and is immoral, um, she has to say no out of obedience to Christ. Um, an exception, I think, also must be made when physical or sexual abuse is involved and the preservation of a woman's or child's life is in danger. In this case, the higher law of perfect, protecting life supersedes this command. Uh, you know, Jesus brought this up when his disciples were eating the, the corn on the Sabbath or the grain on the Sabbath, and they were criticized for that. And he, he reminded them of the Old Testament principle when David and his men ate of the, the showbread uh, that, that only the priests were allowed to partake of because their lives were at stake. It was a higher, it was a higher law. Uh, we also see that example in the Hebrew midwives who were told to kill the, the, the uh, male children in Israel in Exodus chapter 1, and they refused to do that, and God honored them for that. Um, so submission is never an excuse uh, for abuse of any kind. Submission is uh, respect. Um, in fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, in Paul's um, passage on, the, on this, 22 to 33, he uses the word respect uh, at the end of that passage as equivalent to submit. Um, and we'll see that also in, here in 1 Peter 3. When a wife respects her husband and a husband loves his wife, they model the beautiful relationship between Christ and the church which is actually part of the main purpose of marriage. You know, Christ designed 
a husband and wife to model the love between Christ and the church. And Paul brings that out in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, you know, that as the church, us, all of us here today as believers, um, we are to submit to Christ. Um, uh, and, and Christ, in turn, loves us as believers, each one of us. And, and a husband and wife relationship of submission and leadership and respect is, um, is to model that of Christ in the church. So when we, when we do this well in our relationship, we're actually a testimony of this is what Christ and the church look like to the world. Um, well, Paul goes on. That's a whole mouthful, I know. <laughs> um, uh, Paul goes on to um, talk about the context and the reason for this command uh, in, in the rest of verse 1. He says, uh, like, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Um, so Paul, I mean, sorry, Peter is saying here, um, you know, the, the context here, and this was probably true in that day and age uh, often, that, that women had come to, to believe in Christ and be followers of Christ, but their husbands had not. And so Peter is giving um, some instruction to those wives in the area of submitting to their husbands um, as a testimony to their unbelieving husband. Um, so the context here is not just to husbands who are spiritual men and servant leaders, that you're, it's okay to submit to them, but submitting even to husbands who are not living in obedience to the word. And I think this is probably primarily um, unsaved husbands, unbelieving husbands. Um, because P Peter says the goal here, the reason for that, the reason for this respectful behavior is that you can win your husband to the Lord. Um, you know, that, that's what the testimony of, of a wife who is properly submitted to her husband can do. She can win her husband to the Lord. She may be used to win him to the Lord. I, I was reading the testimony of, of St. Augustine who talked about his mother Monica and, and saying that because of her, her respectful behavior, her submissive behavior to her husband, um, she won him to the Lord uh, at the very end of his life. Um, and that was a blessing to St. Augustine as well. Um, and, you know, I, I would also say that I think there's a principle here, even for believing husbands, those who claim to be followers of Christ, who are living in disobedience to the word. Um, you know, what does a Christian wife do when her husband is not walking with the Lord, who's, who's walked away from the Lord, who's living in disobedience? Um, I think this applies there as well. She can win her husband back to the Lord, back to a right relationship with the Lord by her own conduct and behavior. Um, and he says, um, he gives us a little instruction about um, the method by which we are to do that or wives are to do that. He says in verse 2, when they see respectful and pure conduct. Um, you know, two important issues here. Um, and remember, Peter's a married man. Um, and uh, so he, he knows... Um, you know, he understands this relationship, um, and he's telling these wives, this is the best way to do that. Uh, it's, it's to win them uh, without a word, uh, not nagging or preaching or criticizing or disrespecting them, uh, but instead by the conduct of their wives, her godly conduct. You know, it's interesting that word conduct here, anastrophe, is, speaks of a pattern of life. And Peter uses this a number of times in his, his passage, um, uh, I mean in his book, that it's, it's a pattern of lifestyle that she has that can win her husband back to a right relationship with God or, or perhaps even a relationship with God. And he, he talks two things about that conduct. Um, uh, one is that it's respectful, and the second is that it's pure. These are two important issues in the pattern of her life. First of all, that the pattern of her life is to be one of respect. Um, Wives, I would just tell you, this is the big issue with your husband. <laughs> Respect. Um, um, men, in a sense, receive love 
with R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> um, you know, they want to know that their wives respect them. Uh, huge issue for men. Uh, you disrespect your husband, it's going to be very difficult for him to love you the way he, he should. I'm not saying he shouldn't do that. These are unconditional <laughs> commands. Um, but I'm saying you're going to make it a lot more difficult. As uh, Egridge says, you know, it becomes the crazy cycle. She disrespects me, well, I won't love her. So she won't disrespect me, so I won't love her. And the way to turn ar that around is for one of you to say, I'm going to fulfill my part in the marriage. I will love her. And guess what? It's hard for a woman to disrespect a man who loves her, truly loves her, sacrificially and, and in, in, in a servant kind of way and always puts her interests first. Um, and so she can respect him. And when he feels that respect, boy, that makes him love her even more. Uh, and that's the energizing cycle. If you've never heard uh, love and respect, I encourage you. It's a great, a great um, thing to do, a great book to read. Um, you know, and the second part, and, and I remember, I always remember the story, uh, you know, we like to tell stories about uh, some of our older folks that are with the Lord, but one of them was Russ Butler. Russ Butler was uh, an older gentleman. Many of you knew him. He was a, he was a tough as nails old Vermonter. Um, he, he, he was a blacksmith who could squeeze the, the life out of your hand at, at 80 or 90. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was just a tough guy. And, uh, and I love to hear the story of how Russ came to know the Lord. Um, they had a, a handicapped daughter, a mentally, uh, handicapped daughter and, and they loved her very much, but, um, eventually they had to put her in a home and, and, uh, and every time that, uh, Lois went to, to visit visit their daughter, uh, Lori, and, and she would come back, and she would just fall in pieces, and she was just a wreck after that. Well, Lois got involved in a Bible study, came to know Christ, and, uh, and he started to notice when she came back, she, she had a piece about her. She, had, she was different, and she, he just started to observe her behavior, and it was so convicting to him. He said, I've got to have what you have. <laughs> you, you got to, you've got to give me that. And she led him to Christ um, by this very way, by her respectful behavior towards him. Um, the other part of this that Paul says is important, the method of, um, of this pattern of conduct is that it's pure. Um, so a wife's moral purity, pure in relation to other men in those relationships, pure in mind and heart, um, you know, not reading the racy romance novels, the TV soaps, the internet shows, um, you know, but pure in mind as well as heart. Um, I wrote it this way, a heart unclouded by sinful thoughts and emotions. And someone said this, a heart so passionate for Christ alone that her husband would have to go through Christ first to get to her <laughs> and that he would be drawn to her Jesus. Um, Christy and I kid about this. Um, she read that book, Sacred Romance, by John Eldridge, and he talks about, you know, Christ being uh, wild in his love for us, you know, going to extremes that we wouldn't go to. And, and so she, she started referring to Christ as her more wild lover. I struggle with that a little bit. You know, it's hard to compete with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the reality is when w before we got married uh, and we knew we were going to get married, we promised each other second place in each other's life. Uh, we said, Jesus is going to be first in my life, each of us. Um, and, but but we'll give you the best second place that we can give. Um, now, then we had to figure out how to do that and work that out <laughs> for the next going to be 44 years. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a, a wife who has pure conduct, who has a pure heart and mind, that is attractive to her husband. Um, and, and that's going to draw him to Christ. Um, well, Peter goes on to give not only um, kind of the, the command, but also the internal attitude of adornment for wives in verses 3 through 6. 
He says, <clears throat> do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. Um, so Peter's going to talk about um, adornment here or beauty. And the first thing he tells us and tells these wives in verse 3 is to avoid a focus on external adornment or beauty. And he gives three examples of that. Um, the braiding of hair, the, the putting on of gold jewelry. Literally, jewelry isn't in there. The putting on of gold and the clothing you wear. Um, now, we need to be careful here. We can fall off on both sides of this wagon, okay? Um, he's not legalistically saying you're not allowed to um, fix your hair or put on a piece of jewelry or, or clothe yourself. I um, mean, <laughs> obviously, he's not, he's not ruling out these things in total, or you, he would be saying wear no clothes. Um, <laughs> But he's saying here that that shouldn't be the focus or the priority of a woman's heart. Um, I would say the other part of this that we can fall into is the idea that, you know, frumpy is spiritual. Um, and that, you know, I'll just look bad and that makes me more spiritual and I'll walk around really proud of that. <laughs> um, that's just as wrong. Um, you know, God loves beauty. Um, we live in Vermont. You look outside. God created this beauty. I, I saw a picture uh, from this lunar lander that this private company is, is sending to the moon. I guess it's supposed to land on Thursday. And, and they had a picture of the earth of that, with that lunar lander. And it was just awesomely beautiful, this place that God has given to us. You know, I'm reading through Exodus, and, and it's about the tabernacle, and, and, you know, God is laying out the plan for the tabernacle, and it's all gold, everything's gold-plated, and there's tapestry that are incredibly beautiful, and, 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 it sa and he says twice in that passage, for glory and for beauty. So God's not against beauty. Um, you know, God created your wife to be beautiful, um, and hopefully we have that same expression of joy that Adam had, <laughs> you know. She's beautiful to me. Um, and, and that's not wrong. And, and, you know, wives and young women, men are visual, so beauty matters to them. Um, but the focus here is don't make external beauty the priority. Um, don't make that, you know, the one all and end all. Um, and by braiding of hair, he's referring to extravagant hairstyles, gold jewelry, you know, um, you know, making the next piece of jewelry the, the all in all, or the clothing you wear, you know, um, I won't mention stores, no, <laughs> uh, you know, not making always more and more clothes and, and more expensive clothing the focus, um, you know, that isn't, um, that isn't the kind of adornment that uh, a submissive wife focuses on. Um, instead, he says, cultivate a, fo a focus on internal adornment or beauty. He says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. In other words, the internal. Um, you know, let your real beauty as a Christian wife be the internal beauty of your heart, your inner self. That should be the focus and the priority. And then he tells us several things that characterize that internal beauty. He, says, he said, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, or an unfading, some versions, versions say. Um, you know, this, this word um, speaks of being imperishable or uncorruptible or undying or unfading. What he's telling us here is, you know what? External beauty will fade. <laughs> you know, we're all going to get older. We're not going to look like we did when we were younger. External beauty ha does not have a lasting value. Um, someday all of those acute, acute, I can't say that word, accoutrements, whatever, <laughs> they're going to be left to somebody else. They're going to fade away in importance. Um, but the thing that's going to last is the internal beauty of a woman's heart. Um, and he mentions two characteristics. You know, what does that look like? Um, he says, a gentle and quiet spirit. Um, 
unless we think these are kind of some kind of put downs. Um, you know, the first thing he says that characterizes a godly wife and woman's inner beauty is a gentleness of spirit. This word is used four times in the New Testament. Guess who the other three times it refers to? Jesus. <laughs> you know, um, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Jesus said about his own heart, I'm gentle and humble in heart, same word, or meek. He says in his great sermon on the mount and the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek or the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And he says <clears throat> in Matthew 21, 5, when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it says he came gentle and mounted on a donkey. So this is not, um, this is not a characteristic just for, for women. Um, to be gentle is to be found uh, looking like Jesus Christ. Um, so he says, you know, be, don't be pushy, don't be self-assertive, don't be demanding one's right or demanding my own way. That doesn't, that, that isn't a good internal uh, characteristic for a godly wife. Um, you're to be gentle in heart, to be meek in heart <clears throat> as Christ was uh, and is. The second word is um, <clears throat> the, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Um, you know, this word, again, means quiet or tranquil or peaceful. Um, you know, First Timothy talks about leading a, a peaceful and quiet life, the same word. Uh, that's why we pray for our leaders. Um, I'm reminded that this verse um, and this characteristic applies to men as well as women. Um, I know this because in First Thessalonians 4.11, and I'm going to read the King James version of this, um, he tells um, brothers or brothers and sisters, to, so all believers, that you study that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Um, that you study to be quiet, to be tranquil. So this is given to all believers. The reason I know this verse so well is because when I was a young person in a, in a Christian school, when you were rowdy in class or talked too much, um, the punishment was you had to write this verse out. Stay in at recess or, or after school and write a hundred times that you study to be quiet and, to do, your own, and to, to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So I've written this verse a lot of times. <laughs> and it's imprinted in my mind in the King James Version. <laughs> and I even tried to figure out that if you tape four pencils together at an angle, that you could, in writing it once, you might be able to write it four times. <laughs> it was a great theory. I don't think it ever worked, but it wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> you know, God calls us as believers, and he calls wives here specifically to a tranquility of spirit, um, you know, you know, when someone enters your home, when your husband <laughs> comes home from work or you get back together, is it a peaceful place? Is it, is it a refuge? Or does, you know, does the fight begin when it, when it, when it comes through the door, you know? I mean, it, to, to have a tranquil, to have a quietness of spirit uh, means that we're, we're trusting the Lord. I mean, this is based on a deep trust in God, that we're resting in him. Uh, and God calls a, co a godly wife to have a, a quiet or tranquil spirit. And so my question to you, wives, is am I characterized by a meek or gentle and tranquil spirit? You know, this is so counterculture, cultural for us today. Huh? You know, women today are told they need to be more like a man, chest thumping, arrogant, and loud. Um, you know, you got to be strong. You got to be overbearing and obnoxious if need be. Uh, but God has a different standard for a godly wife and, and um, in the home. It's to create an atmosphere in her marriage and home that's a gentle refuge from the noise, the anxiety, the tension, the fighting, and the aggression of the world around us. Um, a peaceful tranquility rather than a nagging competitiveness. Um, your husband doesn't need a competitor, he needs a completer, as God designed you to be. Um, and this is a woman of true lasting influence, one treasured by her husband and her children, but most importantly, Peter concludes, which in God's sight is very precious. 
Um, God highly values a woman who exhibits and a wife who exhibits these characteristics um, because it displays a deep trust in God himself. Um, He sees it, he observes it, and you can almost hear him (laughs) speaking from heaven saying, yeah, that's my precious daughter. (laughs) That's my beautiful girl. Um, You know, would that God would be saying that about you as well. You know, sometimes we... I hear people say, well, that's just not me. You know, that's, I'm type A, you know, I'm a mover and shaker. I'm active, maybe even a little ADD. Um, And, you know, God has created wives as well as husbands with different personalities, temperaments, and gifts, and it's not going to look exactly alike. It doesn't have anything to do with intelligence or talent. God isn't asking women or wives to be ignorant or untalented or ungifted. Um... Uh, but he is asking them to cultivate a gentle and tranquil spirit. Um, That's a lasting character trait that God will honor. You can be uh, a smart, highly gifted woman, yet maintain a gentleness and peacefulness of spirit. And that is a rare kind of beauty that God loves. And it will have a powerful impact on your home. Peter goes on to give a couple of examples um, of this. Verse 5, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. So, you know, again, uh, women who were holy, women who were trusting and hoping in God, um, demonstrated this kind of submission to their husbands. Um, And then he singles out one in particular in verse 6, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Um, You know, again, lots of room for misunderstanding here. I mean, first of all, when we see as Sarah obeyed Abraham, you know, we think, are we reading the same text here? (laughs) I mean, you remember all those stories about Sarah? Um, Not all of them were um, great. you know, I mean, she, she had to work, you know, she, you know, told her husband to do things that he shouldn't have done, and he went passive on her, and that was the Hagar story, and, you know, I mean, she, she, she laughed when the Lord told her she was going to have a child, you know, because <laughs> she was way too old. I mean, it was a journey for Sarah. I just want to say that. <laughs> and, and what he says to, to use as an example was her ultimate obedience. I mean, she followed her husband from Ur of the Chaldees all the way to the, to the promised land. And she stuck with him. Uh, and, you know, when he was making mistakes and doing stupid things, I mean, God protected her. <laughs> um, so much so that Hebrews 11, 11, in God's great hall of faith, he honors her. It says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age And here's why, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Apparently, when she got done laughing, she took God seriously. And she trusted him that she could still conceive, though she was 90 years old. (laughs) And she did the things to have a child um, in faith. uh, And God blessed her for it. Um, So I think that's the example um, she she gave to, to us. She obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I mean, that sounds funny to us. That would be like Mr. or Sir. They're res- words of respect. Um, she, she spoke to him respectfully. And uh, Peter adds, you are her children, um, you know, her spiritual children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is, uh, that is frightening. So respectful words, respectful behavior, and... Um, And he adds, do not fear anything that is frightening or have no fear in doing so. You know, what causes a wife to operate out of fear? You know, there's probably a lot of answers to that. You may have grown up in a background of fear in a home. Um, Fear of the past, fear of the present, fear of the future. Uh, fear of abuse, fear of being taken advantage of, being walked on, um, fear of insecurity, fear of abandonment, 
fear of a lack of acceptance, fear of anxiety over loneliness, money, people, you know, all of those things. There are plenty of things for a wife to fear, um, that she could fear. But the example of Sarah was that she submitted to her husband, but she didn't do it out of fear. Um, she trusted always that God was bigger than that. So she didn't have to be hyper overprotective or controlling or try to measure up with some kind of performance uh, or even going passive. Um, she could purpose to be a godly wife and refuse to ever fear um, her husband or anyone else. Anything else that's frightening, he said. Uh, so all of that is um, addressed to wives in this passage. Um, and uh, I dare not skip over uh, the next verse that's addressed to us guys, <laughs> us husbands. So I'm going to stop us there because I'm looking at the time and we need some time um, to, to finish up the service. So um, I promise uh, we'll talk to husbands next, next week. <laughs> uh, we're going to go out and get the kids. We're going to do something a little different today. So I want to kind of let you know what the plan is um, we, um, as you know, have been trying to support and encourage some uh, a pastor and some folks in Ukraine. Um, and this week, uh, Fred and Kyle and I had the opportunity to do a Zoom call with um, Pastor Yashenko, uh, Zhenya, they call him, um, and uh, Mike Gustafson from uh, ABWE, a missionary there uh, that we've worked with. And... Um, and they have been two years in the middle of Kiev in the middle of a horrific war. Um, and we put the, the summary of that in uh, the insert that's in your um, prayer sheet uh, so you can read about that. Um, one of the things as we asked them, they wanted to show us their new uh, refurbished building that we had helped with the, the ventilation system with. And we'd helped with some of the humanitarian aid earlier and... Uh, Another couple, the Dudkas, we'd helped with as well. Um, but Pastor Zhenya said, you know, when we asked him, what, what can we do to help you? Um, he said, you know, I, I'd like to get a picture of your church family. <laughs> and I'd also, if you could do a video to encourage us. So the thought came to my mind of that song, The Blessing. And it just so happens that that was already on the agenda for our closing song. <laughs> So this is what we're going to do today. Um, worship team, you can come up. <coughs> um, Joel and Jess are going to be our videographers today. Um, they're going to help us out with this. Um, we're going to have you uh, stand, and we're going to, kind of like we do on Christmas Eve, we're going to have you circle the auditorium, um, except, except don't cover the stage. I'm going to take this off in a minute. Um, and... Um, and so you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, you can go ahead and gather in a circle. And we're going to let Joel in the middle here um, videotape us singing this to them. Um, and it, it'll be, I'm going to say some things first, just so you know. Um. <clears throat> Can we pull that down too? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say a few words um, uh, to them first. If I can make this thing work. The Lord put a passage of scripture on my mind uh, for them this week. Um, so are we ready, Joel? Okay. So Pastor Zhenya and uh, Mike and all of our brothers and sisters at, um, sorry about being emotional, <laughs> at Bible and Life Church, uh, we at Linden Bible Church are so privileged to support you and through these um, two plus years of hardship and war 
and loss and grief. Um, and so we want to send you a word of encouragement uh, today. And uh, I want to read a psalm to you, and hopefully uh, this will get translated for you. It's Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we're going to raise our hands today and stretch out to you, if everyone will do that. Um, and we're going to sing a blessing from God over you today.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. We're going to try and get that, uh, see if we can get that translated so it'll be on the bottom of the screen in Ukrainian. Uh, so they can hear, uh, as they're listening to our words, they can hear it and uh, see it in their language. So thank you for staying and doing this. Uh, it's a privilege to support our brothers and sisters in Christ. So God, we just lift up uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine today. Uh, we pray that this will be a great encouragement to them, that you'll strengthen them, that you'll give them hope, that you'll give them uh, perseverance in the midst of the difficulty that they face, that you'll protect them, Lord and that you will bless them. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. <clears throat>